care from COVID-19. There's no doubt having a vaccine is a game changer in Ontario's fight against this terrible pandemic. But our work is far from over. The truth is we need more heroes like Anita. We need more staff to care for our most vulnerable. COVID-19 exposed the underlying cracks in an old tired system, a system wrestling with decades of underinvestment. As Premier, I made a promise to our long-term care residents and their families. The problems didn't start with us, but I can tell you we're going to fix them. So today I'm glad to be here at George Brown College and what a beautiful location this is. And great folks here to announce our government's new long-term care staffing plan. This plan sets out one of the largest recruitment and training efforts in the history of our country. We're investing up to $1.9 billion a year within the next four years to put 27,000 new boots on the ground in our long-term care homes. That is 27,000 new personal support workers or PSWs, registered nurses, registered practical nurses, and other healthcare staff. More staff to deliver on our commitment to increase daily direct care for each resident to four hours a day by 2025. And folks, I can tell you, those in, uh, who are not involved in long-term care, four hours a day is a trailblazer. And hopefully the rest of the provinces in our, our country will, will follow this. This could be nation-leading level of care for our seniors because they deserve nothing less. But it goes deeper than that, my friends. We want more people working in long-term care to love what they do and thrive in their careers. We're going to offer more education, more training opportunities, more professional development. So more wonderful people like Anita and others take pride in what they do, contribute to our communities and change lives for the better. I wanna thank George Brown College and the Rakai Centers who have already got the ball rolling. There's an urgent need for personal support workers, but there aren't enough training opportunities. George Brown and the Rakai Centers are giving future PSWs the hand-on training they need to succeed, include intense immersive clinical training, four days a week, eight hours a day. These are the kind of innovative partners we need to fix our broken system. And we need more partners like George Brown and the Rakai Centers at the table, ready to work with us to recruit Edu educate and train the next generation of caregivers for our seniors. The safety and the well-being of our long-term care residents and staff throughout this province is a top priority. Thank you and God bless the people of Ontario. Now I'll hand it over to Minister Fullerton. Good afternoon. As a family doctor, as the daughter of a parent who was in long-term care, and today as your Minister of Long-Term Care, I'm proud to be here as we launch our new staffing plan. These have been challenging times, and I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all of our frontline healthcare heroes who work tirelessly every day to support our loved ones. You are the backbone of this sector, and our government knows that to improve the quality of care for residents, we have to solve the long-standing and systemic staffing challenges this sector has faced after decades of neglect and underfunding. Our plan lays out how we will make long-term care a better place for residents to live and a better place for staff to work and how we will achieve our Canada leading commitment to increase direct hands-on care for each resident to an average of four hours a day. To achieve this new standard, we will be investing up to $1.9 billion annually by the fourth year of the plan, with steps and hard targets set to get us there. We will create more than 27,000 new positions for personal support workers, registered nurses, and registered practical nurses in long-term care, as well as a 20% increase in direct care time provided by other care professionals like physiotherapists and social workers. For current staff, we will work with long-term care employers 
to improve working conditions. This is a historic investment, and our plan is the result of extensive consultations with industry leaders and resident and family advocates. And I would like to thank my parliamentary assistant, MPP Effie Triantafilopoulos, for all of her hard work the past few months as she played a leading role in the development of this staffing plan. In January, we will launch consultations with sector partners on legislative and regulatory changes needed to support the implementation of this plan and to ensure that residents are at the center of care. While we implement this multi-year plan, we continue to take action to protect residents and staff today. With over half a billion dollars invested to support prevention and containment efforts in long-term care homes during the second wave of COVID-19. Our government is taking these significant steps to ensure our long-term care system is supported today and for years to come. And we will not stop until working conditions are improved for our staff and our most vulnerable receive the quality of care and quality of life they deserve. Thank you. We'll go to the phone line for questions. First question, please. First question comes from Cynthia Mulligan at City News. Please go ahead. Hi, Cynthia. Hi, Premier. Um, I'm going to ask you a question about long-term care, but first I was hoping you would comment on the Ontario Hospital Association that is calling for uh, mass widespread lockdowns for four weeks. What is your response to this? Again, another growing call for your yeah. government to take action. Well, I appreciate their input. I, I talk to CEOs every single uh, day. Matter of fact, there isn't a day that goes by that I'm not talking to numerous CEOs of hospitals, uh, getting their input, how many ICU beds are available, how many acute care beds are available, and how it's changing. So it's very, very concerning, the situation we're facing right now. We're going to continue consulting uh, with the CEOs of the hospitals, uh, as well as the uh, CEO, uh, Anthony Dale, uh, of the Ontario Hospital Association. But it, right now, uh, Cynthia, everything's on the table. And uh, we, we always take the advice from the medical experts. Follow up. My second question is about long-term care, but it's about one center in particular. It's called Sunnycrest Nursing Home in Whitby. All but one of its residents have been infected with COVID-19. 27 have died, 57 staff, maybe more have been infected. Long-term care inspectors found lack of proper PE use. Less than 50% of staff was working. Residents were not being fed or given medication on time. Wounds were not being treated. This is reminiscent of when the Army went into long-term care in the first wave. Why were the lessons from the first wave actually learned? What happened to the Iron Ring and how is it possible that this got so out of control and it was only nine days later that Lake Ridge went in to take over yeah. management? Yeah, I've, I've heard uh, what's happening out in Whitby. Again, it's very, very concerning. We've had inspectors go in there. We've had over 27,000 inspections through multiple uh, areas, not, not just long-term care within the, the province. And you know something, I, I, I truly believe uh, we have incredible, uh, I call them healthcare heroes, PSWs, doing uh, the best they very uh, they can, but it starts at management. Management has to make sure people are following the standard operating procedures, and it's unacceptable, and we aren't going to tolerate it. I'm going to pass this over to uh, the minister. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. You know, it's it really is a tragic situation when the spread is so rapid like that, and one of our... our um, our issues really is how we're doing the testing. And we certainly ramped up the testing, been doing more testing to identify uh, staff that may be coming in unknowingly uh, with COVID-19. And once it's into the home, it really is an insidious virus. It will spread with asymptomatic spread. And it is so important that we take the additional measures for the additional testing that we're doing uh, to keep it out of the homes. Uh, but once it really um, it gets into the home, once there's a first case, so whether it's a staff uh, or a resident, the public health unit of the area is immediately involved uh, and they uh, are activated uh, immediately. 
Then the partner, uh, usually it's a hospital partner, is involved. Uh, the, so there's the public health, the partner that's the hospital. In some cases, it's, a, it's another uh, management company. Uh, and, and so what we do is we make sure that the, the home is supported right from the beginning. Uh, so even though a management order or a voluntary management contract might not be signed until a little later, these are immediate measures. But the way we do the testing now is to make sure that we get the test back in bulk. So instead of having a few tests come back one at a time or five or six, we want them to go in, have a quick turnaround time and get the results back so we know what we're dealing with very quickly. And so that's why you see the sudden surge in, in cases because the swabs would have been done um, on mass. Um, but I want everyone to know that we have um, the activated uh, partners, many of them involved right away. And sometimes that's not clear. So I want to make sure that everyone understands that. Thank you for um, your concern. Next question. Next question comes from Lucas Meyer at News Talk 1010. Please go ahead. How are you doing, Lucas? Hi, Premier. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, if there are going to be further restrictions in place, are you considering any further financial compensation for people who have to stay home? Well, what we're doing is we're working with the federal government right now to make sure that people are taken uh, care of through EI or other other forms. Uh, I'm always concerned about the small businesses too. Uh, if that time comes, if we have to take further action, then yes, to answer your question very straight up, yes, there'll be additional uh, forms of assistance for small business owners. Follow up. Thank you. And on uh, the health side, it seems, it seems we're running out of options to respond to the surge in cases and hospitalizations. Um, in terms of the table, are you considering implementing a curfew? No, I, I don't think we're there to a curfew, but uh, if, if we all just stop with a, a socializing and having uh, you know friends and family over, we're, we're doing everything we, we can to make sure that the, this uh, this trend, and that, that's 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 the word I'm using. You see a trend, and the trend continues to to grow, and we're we're throwing everything we can at it. So we're everything's on the table right now. We're going to be discussing this with the health team, uh, along with uh, hospitals and other other folks. But uh, uh, we we have to bend the the trend here because the trend just continues to to grow uh, no matter what we're doing. And where it's concentrated, it's really concentrated in one area. And that's the GT, and I'll throw Hamilton, GTHA. Uh, that, that's where we're seeing the spread, to the exception of uh, uh, Halton. Halton's still about 55. But the other cases are, are just growing at a rapid pace. So everything's on the table, and we're, we're going to address it. Next question. Next question comes from Laura Stone at the Global Mail. Please go ahead. Hi, Laura. Hi, Premier. Um, just on that topic, though, I mean, I know you, you say you're considering this, everything's on the table, but the time, time is running out here. Your government is facing some pretty tough decisions mm -hmm. because the lockdowns in Toronto Peel are expiring. We have this call from the OHA. Yep. Um, they're asking for stricter measures in lockdown regions. So can you tell us what exactly your government is considering? Are you considering a province-wide lockdown and extending the school break? And when are you going to tell the public? Well, Laura, everything's on the, on the table, and, and if, if we do, uh, move forward and we decide to do a, a further lockdown, there's a lot of things to take into consideration. There's the, the education, making sure that we have daycare, making sure the educators are ready, making sure that we, as simple as having hotels for people that have COVID, that we can put them into hotels instead of at home. We have to make sure that we, we have something for the businesses um, you can't, we just can't keep going on like this for these poor business owners, small business owners. We have to make sure there's, there's uh, some help for the, the business owners as well. And uh, we, we have to make sure that the healthcare system, the capacity, uh, come up with some other alternatives as we're, we're doing with long-term care. Maybe do we put interim uh, hospitals uh, out there? So there's a wide variety of items that the discussions were going uh, the last couple of days Matter of fact, they're ongoing constantly. Last night, they'll be going today. Uh, but there's a lot of things to consider. Uh, the worst thing we could do is rush out there and make a, a snap decision uh, in, in, in a heartbeat. We have to make sure if we do make this decision, uh, is it going to be uh, two weeks? Is it going to be three weeks? Is it going to be 28 days for a full cycle? So there's so many things to consider. But uh, again, Laura, uh, I won't hesitate. 
will not hesitate to do whatever it takes to, to slow down this trend that we see and uh, get it back uh, well well within the numbers that we can control in our hospitals right now. That's that's the scary part, Laura. When I when I talked to a doc yesterday, and he's he, he told me that he was talking, you know, he had to cancel a surgery for a 42 year old uh, male patient that has cancer. You know that, that 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 we just can't keep going in the way we're going, and because the ICU beds are taking up from COVID patients. So there's a lot of stuff to consider and it's all hands on deck right now. And I got to thank everyone for, for helping out all the docs and the hospitals and frontline uh, healthcare workers. Follow up. Thank you. Um, Premier, I just want to clarify when you're talking about considering, you know, whether, whether it's two weeks, three weeks, 28 days, are you talking specifically about a school closure? Are you, are you talking more uh, generally about, about um, lockdowns? And you also also mentioned daycares in there. So if you do choose to extend the winter break, for instance, as Quebec has done, would you also close daycares? And how would you um, how would you help those essential workers who will have to continue going to into work if they have children as well? Well, we'll make sure, as we did before, uh, that we'll have daycare if we make that decision. And I know the Minister of Education has put the schools on notice uh, as as well. So it's all hands on deck. We have to be ready for anything and, and the trend is moving at a, a rapid, rapid fashion right now. So we're, we're gonna be ready. Last question. Last question comes from Hannah Thibodeau at CBC National News. Please Thanks, go ahead. Hannah. How are you doing? Hi, Premier. Thank right. you for taking my question. Thank I you. really appreciate it. Thank you. you were just talking to uh, Laura there about yes. so many things to consider when deciding on a lockdown, a lot of the premiers have been saying that this is a tough decision for them to grapple with it. How hard has it been for you deciding to shut down the economy, businesses to stop the spread of COVID-19, but also considering the damage to people's mental health and even yeah. an increase in potential suicide? Thank you so much for asking uh, that question because I, I mentioned that all the time to our health experts and we have some of the best health experts uh, there, there is in the country giving us advice, but I said, how do you measure when, when uh, a person has a small business, put everything they've had into it for 50 years, could be second generation, and they have to declare bankruptcy, and they're, they're struggling to put food on their table, pay their rent, mortgage, if they don't have to sell their house, you know that. that and then, and then another area, as you said, uh, when it comes to mental health and addiction. Uh, you know, when we first came to office, he said, well, we're going to do mental health. I said, no, you got to put addiction in there too. And we're seeing that we're, we're seeing, uh, you know, addictions rise right now. We're seeing suicides, uh, rise. So we, we have to measure everything. It, it, it's not always health. Health is number one. That's the number one priority without health. We don't have our economy, but, uh, thank you for, for mentioning the, the uh, addiction sides as well, suicides, everything, domestic disputes are going up, everything is going up. We need, we need to flatten this trend. We need to get the, the, uh, the vaccines out there as quickly as possible. And we, we have a, a well-oiled machine uh, with General Hillier. He, as he told me right from the beginning, uh, he said, Premier, this is a mission and uh, I'm going to accomplish this mission. And I think everyone in the country uh, has, has trust in them and faith that we're going to get this done. Follow up. Let me just let me just follow up by asking how personally this has weighed on you. I was talking to the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, for example, and they're saying that they've actually had to train their staff to become counselors because of what's been happening to the businesses and the business owners across this country. Yeah, that's a really good point because we, we do need a lot of counseling. Everyone, people, people have uh, COVID fatigue, I call it. You know, they're, they're down, but folks, I, I got to stand here and I'm going to give you hope. There is hope and we are going to get through this. We will get people vaccinated and we will turn on the economy just like we did a year ago. A year ago, today, last week, I remember uh, talking the prime minister saying we're short 250,000 people to fill all the jobs. Our economy was booming. I have faith 
and all the people in Ontario and the business owners and the small, medium and, and large businesses. We will turn the economy on the lakes of which this province has never seen. We will get back uh, the, the full employment to the best of our uh, ability. And I have confidence in everyone. I've never seen any, any time in my lifetime a group of 14,770,000 people come together as we were discussing before I came down the, uh, the stairs here about how everyone banded together, pitched in, uh, no, no matter where we went, um, no matter what age people were, everyone had a role to play and everyone has played that role. Uh, and we are stronger together and we will get through it. We just have to hang in there. It's going to be some bumps in the road over the next next little while when you saw the modeling, the numbers were going going up. Uh, but we're, we're going to get through this, folks, and we're going to come out stronger than ever before. And we're going to lead North America in economic development and job creation as we did a year ago uh, today. But thank you and uh, God bless everyone. We'll get through this, folks. Thanks, everyone.